Okay, and welcome to episode 107 of the Health Force Podcast. I appreciate everybody in the audience listening. And actually, today's episode uh, was sparked by somebody sending me a direct message. So, engagement, engagement, engagement. If you enjoy the content that we're putting out, uh, whether you listen to this podcast on audio or you're watching the video through Facebook or YouTube or you're consuming some of our other content on Instagram and Twitter and LinkedIn, Regardless of where you are, we are there. So you can search for us, Ramsden Elite Fitness. I'll spell it one time. It's super easy. Ram, like the animal, R-A-M. Put a little S at the end. So Rams, multiple Rams, R-A-M-S, and then Den, like the little cave where wolves and bears and all them people live. Den, D-E-N. Put it all together. Ramsden Elite Fitness. Normal spellings for those. Find us on social media. Engage with us. Um, you can send us DMs, you can comment in the comment sections, share our stuff, talk about it. And uh, that's what it's all about for me. You know, I don't want to come on the podcast and talk to myself. That would be uh, a waste of time. It would be uh, prideful. It would be a lot of things that aren't good. Also, speaking of pride, if you're watching the video version of this episode, so that means you're on either YouTube or your Facebook, look at the locks. Huh? Look at the locks. Look at the. Ba- I mean, woo! We're looking good, feeling good. I like to, uh, you know, get after it. And today, uh, again, interesting episode. We were doing a lot of, I don't want to say uh, negative things, but for me, there are two ways to be a, to have a productive podcast. Number one, by challenging and, you know, critiquing and explaining uh, wrongdoing and errors. I think that that becomes a net positive when you remove negative influence from the world or call out individuals who are pushing things that actually would harm the individuals and try to bring some rationale and some science behind those things to correct that so we get less people believing in the wrong things. That's a good thing. Net positive. The other thing is by actually just producing good content, by producing positive, that'll add to your life or your regimen. And today is an example of the latter. We got some positivity coming. Uh, We're going to talk Dave Brailsford and his marginal gains theory and how we can apply that to fitness and nutrition and weight loss. Um, So again, first thing I want to do is thank my good friend Pubs, who interacts with us, interacts with me personally as well on my personal channels, uh, gave me the idea to do this podcast. He shared the information. I had not heard of the gentleman. Um, You know, the idea, though, is not foreign to me. The idea of, of marginal gains, and again, we'll get to explaining it. It's not foreign. In fact, it's an integral part of what I do personally, uh, what I do for business. Uh, everything for me is, you know, could be su- summarized and captured by this identity of marginal gains. I'm a big believer in its theory. And then we've got some practical examples of it that, we're, that we'll go through today. And I think it's ever more important because we live in a world where people are not focused on marginal gains. They're focused on these cataclysmic, monumental things. Um, and usually when you do that, when you're focusing on trying to lose 10 pounds in a week or something like these, these extreme ends of fitness, you actually capsize and undermine your long-term success. So this is a beautiful episode. It's the perfect topic for today. And again, I can't give pubs thanks enough. And that kind of goes hand in hand with what I was saying before about having the engaged audience. If you guys have any opinion, even if you disagree with me on the podcast or a topic that we're going over, or you have a different point of view, or maybe you do agree and it's helped you, you got to engage. I mean, we live in this world. we got these tools. The purpose is to actually engage. And guess what? We respond to all the comments. So whatever platform I get, I already rattled them off in the beginning. You find us, you tweet us, you engage with us, you message us, whatever. Uh, let's get after it and let's get some good ideas flowing. So into the podcast today, We got a a gentleman by the name of Dave Brailsford. He's actually Sir David Brailsford. He is from the UK and England. He's a British cycling coach. I'm going to read off the Wikipedia page to give you guys some background. Uh, He was the former uh, former performance director of British cycling. He's now the current manager of team. I have no idea. Ineos. I don't know. It's a cycling team. Uh, I'm going to skip down to his career from Wikipedia. Uh, he spent his early career working as an export sales manager at Planet X Bikes. So he's into cycling, guys, just if you didn't get the hint. Uh, he's first employed by British Cycling as a consultant in 1998. After lottery founding began the previous year, Brailsford became a programs director before becoming performance director in 2003, following the departure of Peter Keane. Now, marginal gains philosophy. This is the important part. Perk your ears up, get a general idea of what, of what we're going here, and then we'll expand this thing into your fitness and getting yourself some gains. So at British Cycling, Brailsford was noted 
for his innovative concept of marginal gains. Okay, Quote, the whole principle came from the idea that if you broke down everything that you could think of that goes into riding a bike and you improved all those different variables by 1%, you will get a significant increase when you put them all together. So I'll stop. We're gonna, I'm going to repeat that again. Perk the ears up. Get this in. This is important. Quote, he says, the whole principle of marginal gains came from the idea that if you broke down everything that you could think of that goes into riding a bike and improved each of those things by 1%, you will have a significant increase when you put it all together. Now, after that sinks in, you might have your gears going in your brain already about how this is going to transfer over to your fitness, to your health, to your exercise, to your nutrition, to your supplementation. And you can quickly see how this becomes an important concept. Because again, if you improve multiple areas and 1% increase isn't, we're not saying 50. So if you're trying to lose 100 pounds, you don't need to lose 50 pounds to think that you're successful. There's there's ways that you can implement getting that first pound down, first five, you know, you start with these incremental things. So I'm a big believer, again, in small victories. Uh, think about the long term. And for me, how you get to long term success is by focusing on habits and creating short term behaviors that map to the long term. Where people get in trouble is they do short term behaviors that map to the short term. So it's all about how quickly can I do this? How fast can I do that? What's the shortcut for this? And then what ends up happening is they might have an increased success in the beginning over somebody who's got more of a long-term vision. But when you fast forward a year, two years, it, it's, not, it's usually not, not even close between the two long-term or short-term. The long-term wins out. And you know, even if you don't realize um, that you want long-term success, which I know sounds pretty crazy, but if you think about most people and you ask them what you, know, what you want to accomplish, most people are going to say, I want to lose 25 pounds. I want to lose it now. You know, and, and I, I and I understand that that is a true emotion and true feelings. They do want to lose that weight and they want to lose it now. That They don't want to wait a year. You know what I mean? Like, I, I get it. You want it fast. You want it now. But I think it's kind of a false choice. I think it's kind of a, 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 um, a failure from the start. It, just the way that the, the mentality is set up, it's going to lead a lot to failure, even though you're, you're, you know, you're so excited about it. Because the real question becomes, hey, Here's the real question. In a year from now, one year from now, if I told you, if you wanted to lose 25, 30 pounds or whatever, 50 pounds, um, but I like the number 25 because it's, it's extremely doable for almost every person. And again, kind of weight loss is tough because it depends on where your starting point. So, you know, you could be 140 pounds and need to lose weight because you're carrying too much body fat and you could be 275 pounds and do the same thing. Well, it's easier if you're 275 to lose you know, 50 pounds, 25 pounds or whatever. So, and again, you don't want to go from 140 to 90 pounds. You, I think that'd be too much. So again, it's all relative, which is why I like to go with 20, 25, because most people that relates to them. And so if you could lose 20, 25 pounds and keep it off one year from now, would you, would you sign up for that? Is that something that you'd be into? And most people are going to say yes. So then that's the focus. It's not 25 pounds as fast as possible. It's not 25 pounds by summer. It's not 50 pounds in a year. You, you, you break it down come up with something that's tangible and also accomplishable. And again, uh, I think, you know, putting your, your, your goal posts a year from now, instead of three months, it is a humongous, um, humongous indicator of success. So, so we heard him say there, marginal gains. There's, there's, there's various aspects that you can improve. And if you make small improvements across various things that the, that the whole picture, the, the all togetherness, uh, in, you know, increases. I'm going to let my dog in here before he jumps on the damn door. Come on in. That's what we do in a podcast. No over edit. I ain't going to edit that. Um, so think about your fitness. How many different variables are there to somebody's success? I mean, just think off the top of your head. There's the exercise and the workouts. There's the fitness part of it. Physical activity part of it. There's your nutrition. What kind of foods are you putting in your body? There's your supplementation. So what kind of vitamins, what kind of minerals? Are you doing protein powder? Are you doing pre-workouts? Are you doing fish oils? Are you doing sleep aid products? Like, you know, supplementation. There's, there's, um, I think overall healthy habits. So this is more like health. So think about taking the stairs over the elevator. You know, that's not working out. It's not going to the gym, but it's still a way to get physical activity. So that's just four things off the top of my head. And if you think about it, each of those things can break down to multiple branches. So inside of nutrition, I mean, you've got, you know, calories, you've got protein, carbs, fats, meal timing, different techniques like fasting, 
uh, a post-workout, pre-workout. I mean, literally all these different variables and aspects inside of those branches. The idea becomes if you try to map a long-term vision and get better at most of these things, you know, and again, I'm not saying you got to create this big map and understand and, and make it complicated so that there's 50 different things you're working on. I'm not saying that. Okay. I'm not saying that, but to understand the principles here, if there's multiple things to improve at, if we have a long-term vision instead of a short-term vision, that gives us a better chance to improve at multiple things across the board, therefore should increase our overall success. That's kind of my hypothesis for, for today's podcast. Uh, I'm going to keep reading here from the Wikipedia page. We've got a couple articles to read, and we'll tie it all together. So moving on, Brailsford's approach involved constant measuring and monitoring of key stats. He lists a couple things that they would track, but just to get an idea of like power output, weaknesses for cyclists, things like that. Um, he, here's another quote by him. You know, and This is an example of a way his brain's working. Do you really know how to clean your hands? Without leaving the bits between your fingers. If you do things like that properly, you're going to get a little bit, you will get ill a little bit less. They're tiny things, but if you clump it together, it makes a big difference. Close quote. So, you know, forget about washing your hands. Okay. Forget about that. But he's right. But you can take any mundane task, any mundane task in your life. How about this? When your alarm goes off in the morning, do you get the hell out of bed or do you sit there for another 20 minutes on, on Twitter and Facebook? Again, just these very mundane things that we all got to deal with. The principle that he's talking about margin against, if you improve that, washing your hands in his case for cyclists because it leads to better health because his, you know he believes that his athletes will get sick less. Well, that's good. If you're sick less, you can train more. You should have increased performance. Well, same thing here. If, you, if you're worried about not having enough time, that's one we hear in fitness. So I'll try to translate some of this over to fitness stuff so you guys can – look, and here's the thing too. Pause the podcast. You're, if you're, I'm about to get in these tips all throughout the podcast. This is not going to be one where I just at the end give you everything that you need or in the beginning give you everything you need. I'm just going to commentate in addition to what we're reading here. So if you're going to make notes on your phone, do, don't, don't do it when you're driving. Come on, be smart. But you have a little note uh, app on your phone or Evernote or whatever or your pen, pen and paper if you're old school. You can pause, write down the tips that apply to your fitness. And then at the end of this, you should have a list. And then... Here we go. You can go through that list and try to improve those things in your life, or at least make some awareness around it. You know, post it somewhere so that even if it's not a, you know, a huge monumental strategy where you got to change all your things, these things should at least be on your mind, and that you, you'll start to subconsciously and even in the moment start making changes for the better. Oh, so that's good. Um, so you know, if you're somebody that is saying I don't have enough time to work out, and that is one that I hear all the time. And I hear it from everybody and their mama, okay? It don't matter if it's a business owner saying it. It could be somebody that works in a nine to five. It could be somebody with kids. It could be somebody that's a socialite that's going out all the time. It doesn't matter. I hear it nonstop from everybody. And the truth of the matter is it's a phony excuse. It is completely fabricated off of delusion, okay? Yes, that hits you hard. If you're somebody that said that in the past, I don't got time. Sorry to make you aware, but trust me, you'll thank me later. I'm the one that... That'll give it to you. Honestly, you're delusional. Okay. Now, does that mean that there's somebody out there that maybe is a single parent that's got three kids and works three jobs? And, you know, of course, there's always exceptions. Of course, there's nothing's in absolutes. But let's not paint the worst case scenario as a way to try to excuse yourself uh, from finding time. Okay. And so most people, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. I'll say that you work a job and it's eight to nine hours a day, five days a week. You're, maybe you got kids and then you do some social activities, whether that's taking them to sports after the school or you, you know, you're, you're in a bowling league or a softball league, or you like to go to happy hours after work, whatever. You've got some social aspect during the week. Okay. Let's say that's you. You still don't get to come here and say, I don't got time to work out. That's right. There's CEOs out there that work ungodly amounts of hours that find time to work out. So, Pretty much, if you find like the worst case scenario, which would be like a busy CEO who works an ungodly amount of hours and then has a little bit of time, like he's always sacrificing his family time so he can work and build his career and, you know, make his company profitable or, you know, this, that, and the other. If that person can work out, then you, who are less busy than him or her, you can find time to work out. That's, that's, that's the gist of that little principle is if you can find one example of somebody that's more busy than you and they find time to do fitness, then you really don't have an excuse. So that's most of you out there. You do not have time. You know, you do not make 
uh, the, the excuse that time is a factor. And in fact, what it really is, is a prioritization of the time. What you're saying is, I'm not prioritizing my time to have workouts. And that's fine if you're going to say that, but that becomes your error to live with and something that you need to correct if you are serious about getting your health and fitness in check. So if that's somebody that says something, right? I don't have time. Well, one thing you can start doing is how fast do you get up in the morning? When your alarm goes off, do you get out of bed now? Uh, I found personally, I have a huge time sink when I sit in bed and I go through uh, my social medias or, or I go and get the news for the day. Huge time sink and it's about things that don't really matter. You know, I go on Twitter, I read what's trending. And yes, some of it is breaking news. Some of it is things that I didn't know. It was from overnight. And it is important that I get some of that stuff. But, you know, 25 minutes worth? Now, come on, get the hell up. So I made a big effort in 2020. When my alarm goes off, get up. Get up and get going. Go to the bathroom, brush your teeth. Boom, start to the day. And I found uh, that I'm saving 20 minutes a day in the mornings. And I still have five minutes to get the, my news in once I'm up and about. I'll check real quick and it's five minutes, but I'm already moving. And so I don't get stuck and I get sucked into all those things when I'm in bed. So that's just an example of me cleaning up my time. One small thing that you can all start doing. Get up when your damn alarm goes off. Get the hell out of bed. Quit hitting the snooze button. Uh, and, 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 and or, you know, you could even set your alarm 15 minutes earlier. Guess what? Just found you 15 minutes of time. Okay, so... Getting back to this book, Wikipedia, we're going to wrap it up here. It says, peaking in the mid-2010s at the height of Brailsford's reputation, marginal gains philosophy was discussed beyond cycling in the UK mainstream media. Brailsford's 1% factor was also discussed in business circles and internationally. The UK Education Policy Social Mobility Commission argued in 2014 that improvements in the academic, in the academic performance of disadvantaged students in schools could be compared to the cycling team, the aggregation of marginal gains. Later, er, Laterally, who the hell is that? Just throw someone's name in there? I don't know. The philosophy has been criticized and ridiculed, including by Wiggins, who I think was somebody that was working with him. And you know what? The funny part is you're going to have criticisms everywhere. Nothing's perfect. There is no perfect system. I'm not as interested in like, you know, oh, this person ridiculed them. Whatever. Ridicule it then. But um, I think it's a good, you know, good uh, philosophy for life. For productivity and it certainly will translate to fitness so we will sh switch gears here um what, what i'd like to do is i've got two articles i don't know how long they're going to be probably not very long um and then one uh i guess like training manual that i found online from from a performance pro productivity coach for business i think it is um where i'll read you know how he's taken this principle and use it into his business and what he does with his clientele and then I'll, I'll try to tie it all together for fitness and some things that, that, that you guys could do, um, small things, because it, it does matter. And we post about it on our Instagram. If you, look, if you look at our Instagram, especially for things like Active Wednesday, we try to post every Wednesday at 4.30 in the evening. And the theme for Wednesdays is, you know, active lifestyle, you know, active, you know, it doesn't need to be an hour workout every day to get your activity up. So we try to give little tips, 15 minute workouts, walk the dogs, like very cool, little quick things that you could do and implement into your life. So that's kind of how I'm taking this 1% thing and, and trying to work it into some of our posts even, just trying to give people tips that if, hey, here's a little tip, here, you know, here's, here's a little thing here and there, take this, run with it, you, and you do it, enough of these tips, your overall performance and fitness is going to increase. So we're going to read from the Harvard Business Review. Uh, the article is How 1% Performance Improvements Led to Olympic Gold by Even Harrell. This is from 2015. And that's the other thing. What they didn't tell you in Wikipedia is that this Brailsford coach came in, the cycling team for, for England was terrible, always losing. He comes in, he starts to train the, or he changed the mindset around the team, the way that they prepare for things, and they won Olympic gold. And they've been very, very successful in their performance. So again, this could apply to anybody. This doesn't just have to apply to your fitness. It's a fitness podcast, so that's why we're going to tie it together. But this, if you're, like for instance, I'm a football coach. I coach high school football. I'm the offensive coordinator at Riverside High School. I'm responsible for the offense's performance game in, game out. That's my duty. And if we can improve multiple things across the board a little bit, our overall performance on offense gets better. So this principle isn't just, again, for cycling. It's not just for fitness. It's a lot of applications, um, but it's about your mindset. It's about getting it right. So when we get to the article, when Sir Dave Brailsford became head of British Cycling in 2002, the team had no record of success. Oh, almost no record of success. Sorry. British Cycling had won a single gold medal in 76 years. Quickly changed under uh, Brailsford's leadership, 2008 Beijing Olympics, his squad won 7 out of 10 gold medals available 
in track cycling, and they matched the, the achievement at the London Olympics four years later. So there you go. One goal at 76 years. He comes in, gets 7 out of 10, 7 out of 10, back-to-back -back Olympics. 14 gold medals by my count out of a possible 20. Sir Dave is a former professional cyclist himself. He holds an MBA, applied a theory of marginal gains to cycling. He gambled that if the team broke down everything that they could think of that goes into competing on a bike and then improved each element by 1%, they would achieve a significant aggregate performance. Or, yeah, they would achieve a significant aggregated increase in performance. So, there's a little bit of Q&A between the Harvard Business Review and then Dave's answer. I'll read some of the most interesting and we'll move on. Question, can you share some examples of your marginal gains approach? Answer from Dave. To give you a bit of background, when we first started out, the top of the Olympic podium seemed like a very long way away. Aiming for, aiming for gold was very daunting, too daunting. And as an MBA, I'd become fascinated with casing and other process improvement techniques. It struck me that we should think small, not big, and adopt the philosophy of continuous improvement through the aggregation of marginal gains. Forget about perfection. Let's focus on progress and compound those improvements. By experimenting in a wind tunnel, we searched for small improvements to aerodynamics. By analyzing the mechanic area in the team truck, we discovered that dust was accumulating on the floor and it undermined our bike maintenance. So we painted the floor white in order to spot any impurities. We hired a surgeon to teach our athlete about proper hand washing so as to avoid illnesses during competition. We were precise about food preparation. We bought, we brought our own mattresses and pillows so their athletes could sleep in the same posture every night. We searched for small improvements everywhere and found countless opportunities. Taken together, we felt that they gave us competitive advantage. So my commentary on this, this essentially, what he's, what he's describing is my take on mindset, okay? It's not even really about the, all these individual actions, okay? He's broken it down that way. He comes from a, a business stat background for statistics and analytics, and so he's, you know, coming up with all these different things that they can measure and try to improve. And that's great. But also, if you have the right mindset, a lot of these things, uh, a lot of these things can improve uh, as well just from that because you start to look at things differently. So if you, you know, for me, when it comes to performance and competition like this, I know they say winning isn't everything, but it's a lot of it. Winning is, is paramount to competition. Without winning, really, it's not really a competition. It becomes a, a, a friendly game. So if your mindset's focused on long-term ability to compete, a lot of these small things that give you advantages, I think you're going to discover. You're, you're going to want bike maintenance to be top of the end, you know, at the top end of things. You're not going to want to go into competition with a poor performing bike. Sleep. I mean, you don't want your athletes tired or in an uncomfortable bed at a hotel or something. You know, like these are small things. But again, if your mindset is about competing, you're going to find ways to just trigger these things all over the place. Look for these gains. Uh, to skip ahead a little bit, the question comes, you've spoken elsewhere about the success of marginal gains, and that can be attributed to culture as much as anything else. Answer. Perhaps the most powerful benefit is that it creates a, con a contagious enthusiasm. Everyone starts looking for ways to improve. There's something inherently rewarding about identifying marginal gains. People want to identify opportunities and share them with the group. Our team became a very positive place to be. Now, one caveat is that the whole marginal gains approach doesn't work if only half the team buys in. In that case, the search for small improvements will cause resentment. If everyone is committed, in my experience, it removes the fear of being singled out. Mutual accountability. So again, the way he speaks there, it's very mindset oriented. It's not as much about the tasks and the mundane as it is about the big picture culture stuff. So even think about the place where you work, your place of employment. We all understand uh, that corporations, as they get larger, tend to really lose their culture and or institute um, draconian structure because they're so worried about employees not doing their jobs and they end up making a lot of rules and things that we got to follow that doesn't make a lot of sense to the employees so you know culture is extremely important because that leads to productivity and that leads to performance so if your team at your place of employment has the same mindset together and it's one focused on positivity if it's not one where you know because there's workplaces where people are complaining all the time they're negative, 
Um, they're, they're overburdened. Like you take all these, ne all these negative things, you apply that on that work group. Now all of a sudden that work culture is negative. Good luck having a performing team. But the opposite is true. If we can get, if you can work in a unit and a, and a group of employees and coworkers where you guys are focused on the positive and it essentially creates a system where yes, marginal improvements are going to happen over time because everybody's looking for improvements. Um, to me, this makes perfect sense. So good little article moving on. This is an article from jamesclear.com. I, I believe James Clear is the coach that I was talking about earlier. I'm going to open up a little about me page. James Clear is a New York Times bestseller. He's wrote a book called Atomic Habits. And yeah, I think he's like a an author, performance, a business, kind of like a consultant. Um, so he wrote an article called This Coach Improved Every Tiny Thing by 1% and Here's What Happened. Um, this is part of his book, Atomic Habits. Um, so this is... There's no date on it, but it's from jamesclair.com. So it's from his book, a little snippet from it. We'll read just a tiny bit. Where do I want to begin? I want to begin. We'll, be, we'll go right here. Burlesford and his coaches began by making small adjustments that you might expect from a professional cycling team. They redesigned the bike, seats to make them more comfortable, rubbed alcohol and tires for better grip. They asked riders to wear electrically heated over shorts to maintain ideal muscle temperature while riding the bike and using biofeedback sensors to monitor how each athlete responded to a particular workout. The team tested various fabrics in a wind tunnel. On and on and on. They didn't stop there. They continued to find 1% improvements and overlooked an une they looked to find 1% improvements in overlooked and unexpected areas. So where other teams weren't focusing, they decided to focus. They tested different types of massage gels. They hired a surgeon to teach about the hand washing. They determined pillow mattresses that they would take. Uh, they even painted the inside the team truck white. So this goes on and on and on. It kind of just, re, you know, again, re, kind of recaps what we read previously. The aggregation of marginal gains. He says it is easy, so easy to overestimate the importance of one defining moment and underestimate the value of making small improvements on a daily basis. Too often we convince ourselves that massive success requires massive action. Whether it is losing weight, nice, applicable, building a business, writing a book, winning a championship, or achieving any other goal, we put pressure on ourselves to make some earth-shattering improvement that everybody's going to talk about. Meanwhile, improving by 1% isn't particularly notable. Sometimes it isn't even noticeable, but it can be far more meaningful, especially in the long run. The difference a tiny improvement can make over time is astounding. Here's how the math works out. If you can get 1% better every day for one year, you'll end up 37 times better by the time you're done. Conversely, if you get 1% worse each day for one year, you will decline nearly down to zero. What starts as a small win or a minor setback accumulates into something much more. So, Again, you, you, you can see a lot of crossover between things like compound interest, which is, you know, a banking term for money. Um, but again, this principle is varied across multiple things. And so I think it's worth considering for your fitness where, you know, I think the biggest, here we go. Application tip, baby. Perk the ears. Here's a little tip. Diet. When it comes to your diet and the food that you're eating, why? I don't want to start with a why question. How does it help you? when you go from one extreme to another on your diet. How does that help you? So if you're somebody that's done that in the past, you know, you should pause, think about your answer and try to come up with something. If you're very bold, you can even send us your answer on social media. But if you're sitting there and you're eating like crap, you're eating McDonald's and fast food and cheats and all this other stuff, and then the next minute you're doing a keto diet, intermittent fasting diet, which is a big change, a big difference. How does that help you? Because the thing that, that I would propose, there's a reason why our nutritional methodology at Ramsley Fitness is very basic. And that's we try to get people accountable to calories and protein goals. Because that's not as big of a change. It's actually a little more subtle. So you go from eating foods with no accountability and you have no idea what you're putting in your body to the first step that we do is, hey, just record what you're eating in this app. It's super easy. It'll take you 15 minutes a day tops, but you learn all this information, you get all this data. Do it, find out how much you're eating, and then we can go from there. And that's always step one. It's always step one. And um, that is a lot easier for people than trying to go on a low-carb, crazy keto diet. It just is. Because we don't even really ask people to change. They naturally start to change you know, on their own a little bit just by joining a program because they're putting a little more effort into it. But even if they didn't, I would argue, but just you know, just by tracking your calories, you are receiving valuable information that you didn't have previously, and that's a win. That's a marginal gain. That's a net positive gain. 
you now have information as to how you're eating previously and have some awareness on the issue. So, you know, again, take, take, uh, take stock of where you are with your exercise and your nutrition, your health and your habits and your supplementation, and just look to make a small improvement. Do not jump into something. Don't be joined in. Here's another little tip. Another little tip. I'm on a roll. I'm on a roll. I'm on a roll. All right. A little bit of singing. Do not, if you're exercise right now, if you're planned physical activity, meaning your exercise, your workouts, not walking down the street, not walking to the car, not walking up the, you know, the stairs. No, no. Going to the gym and working out or working out from your house and doing push-ups and stuff. If it's zero, if you're doing nothing right now, for the love of everything that's good, okay, do not join a high-intensity interval training, boot camp, butt, cycling, nonsensical class. Do not. Okay? They go by various names. I don't care their names. I don't care which one. I don't care how they try to say they're different. They're not different. Uh, a lot of these places are, they, they remind me of like, they remind me a lot of like mills. You know, I keep getting the word. It, right? <laughs> it's actually really funny. So it's like a fitness mill, you know, where we hear all, all these things about, um, you know, like animals that we're treating bad. We just run them through the system. We just run them through the mill. And we we make food out of them or, or we, or, you know, we get something out of them like milk or something. And here we go. We make food out of it. And like the conditions are horrible and terrible. And, and, and it's not really about the individual animal. It's about the process and what happens. Right. So, you know, or, or kind of reminds you of like a sweatshop in China where you're, you're having people that are like severely underpaid and overworked and all this stuff. It's kind of like that. And what I mean is, no, I'm not making a direct comparison. You gotta, you gotta, come on. They, you guys are smarter than that. Don't start saying Franz calling Orange Theory Fitness a Chinese sweatshop. No, come on. Come on. We're thinking higher level than that. What I'm saying is they're all about impressing and just getting you to sweat your A off. <laughs> they don't actually care about your success, both short term and long term, really. Um, for them, the output is hey, can I make this person sweat a lot, burn a lot of calories, and feel like they worked out? you know, and like make them feel tired and give them a good workout. That's their output. That's it. And they don't really care who comes, who goes. And, you know, I'm being a little bit facetious. Yes, yes, they care as in, you know, they don't want to treat you like an animal. And they, they you know, they'll, they'll do the basic things. They'll learn your name, this, that, and the other. But these places have such high turnover and such inconsistent people coming and going. It's not like working one-on-one -on -one with somebody. You know what I mean? When you work one-on-one -on -one with somebody – you care about their day-to-day -day experiences and successes and failures because, you know, there's no other, there's no more intimate relationship than a one-on-one. -on -one. But when you go to these places that are run like big boot camp, group class activity things, you're talking one instructor or maybe two instructors, and there's anywhere from 15 to, you know, I've seen as high as 75 people in these classes. That is not a way to be catered as, to, as, as an individual. What's happening is they make up those workout programs ahead of time before you even get there. So it's predetermined. You know, it's not like you show up and they're going to make a different workout for you. Like the workouts are predetermined for everybody in there. So the out, so just from the nature of that structure, the focus is not on you, the consumer and client. It's not. Their focus is on we're just going to do this great workout. We'll get everybody moving and hopping around and jumping and they'll sweat and they'll leave here feeling good. That's, that's their goal. But do they, you know... How can they overcome that structure and those obstacles to ensure that you're having long-term fitness success? The answer is they cannot. They can tell me when they're until they're blue in the face and give me so much passion and arguments about how they're trying to go above and beyond and they're doing weigh-ins and challenges. And I'm just I'm just telling you from the structure alone, forget about the individuals, the individual instructors and the individual attention that they're trying to give in between classes and join the Facebook group. No, forget about all that. Just the structure of their main product, group fitness. You cannot have enough focus and attention to provide a paying customer to ensure their long-term success. That is my absolute belief. And again, we have plenty of data and studies. If you haven't listened to any of our previous podcasts on group training, you should do that. Search boot camp, search group training, group fitness classes. We've done podcasts on that. And essentially, the data is this. People join for a short-term period. They have some success. They stop going for whatever reason, and it's usually uh, from a lack of value, uh, meaning other things begin, you know, it's cool in the beginning because it's new, but then what happens is other priorities come up and people reprioritize their life and money, and then they stop going to these things uh, or stop going as consistent, you know, as consistently as they used to. 
They drop off after three or four months, they regain weight back, and then usually month nine or 10, they're like, oh, I need to go back to that. Oh, hey, and they, they reschedule, hey, I'm coming back, I'd like to rejoin. They rejoin, and it's the same thing, three or four months, and then they're out. And then they're usually done. Usually people will, like rejoin once or twice, and then either out of embarrassment or out of just that place doesn't work for me, they go on to the next thing, but then they repeat the same process. So again, this, the, you know, when it comes to your fitness, my advice is do not join a place like that because you're going to doom your long-term success. I think they have purpose. You know, it's, they're not without utility. I'm not saying they're a complete waste of time and money for everybody, but I think they should mark. I think the, 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 the ideal customer is a lot more specific uh, who can get the the right benefit out of that worth the money. Uh, I just think it's somebody that's probably a little more physically active than our general population. Somebody that already works out on their own and then wants to change it up or get a specific kind of cardio workout without having to think about it and do it on their own on the weekends. Like that's, that's what I think, you know, is their best value. Is it somebody that's already kind of fit or, you know, in, in between like, you know, on the, on the pathway to becoming fit and they just don't want to think about their next workout or they want to change something up. Uh, but certainly most, most average people are not going to go two or three times a week to a group fitness class and experience long-term success. So there's a little tidbit, just start small. If you're doing zero, just start with push-ups and sit-ups and like, like, you know, it's, you know, sitting down on your couch and standing up or, or like a air squat at, at your house. Don't join a gym. Don't pay money. Just start basic. And if you don't know exactly what to craft, this will be my, my, my 30, my 45 second sales pitch about what we do. And again, it's not to convince you all to buy my stuff or buy what we're doing here. It's just an option for people whose answer to my suggestion is, well, I don't know how to make it work. Or I don't know what to do. And that's fine. It's a very, I mean, it's why we have a business. So it's, it's, a, it's a legitimate concern, especially when you think about the time it takes to research workouts and the right type of workout, this, that, and the other. Well, if you don't have time to figure out how to work out, I think there's two things you can do. Number one, watch a free YouTube video. We have smart TVs. Just go to YouTube, put it on your smart TV, follow along with it. It's going to be a general workout. It's not going to be specific to you, but it's free. It's like going to a group fitness class, except for it's free. Much, much better of an option than going to a boot camp class. Number two, if you want specific training, if you've got certain conditions, your knees hurt, you've got diabetes, you have high blood pressure, on and on and on. If you've got some special considerations where you just don't feel comfortable doing a generic workout that's not catered towards you, you hire a company like ours. It doesn't even need to be ours, but you hire a company that does the work that we do, which is we take everybody in, we onboard them, we look at their profile, we try to figure out uh, all their unique conditions, and we create something from scratch for them that's going to be beneficial, both short term so that they can get going with some momentum, but it's not at the sacrifice of the long term. So the long term vision and plan is still in play, and all they got to do then, they don't got to do the thinking part, they just got to do the, the doing part. So then they go on their app, up, oh, all my workouts are on here, boom, and they just do it. And a lot of times we get clients that just do it at home. Like we don't have clients that, like some, yes, go to the gym and we create workouts with the, you know, a little more complicated exercises or a little more advanced because there's machines there versus somebody that's at home with no weights or anything. They're just doing body weight stuff. But you know, again, marginal gains, you get 1% better at exercise. Like you map that out for the entire year, you know, you've got yourself long-term success. So that's, that, that's my little sales pitch on that. It's, it's an extremely valuable service. It's our online personal training. You just need a cell phone uh, where we have some mobile apps that we get you on. Uh, if you're interested in that, you can just, you know, DM us on any of the social medias, Facebook or Instagram, or you go to the website, ramsleyfitness.com. There's a button that says schedule consultation. We're getting away from a, a lot of, it just depends. You, you can completely automate that process. So you, you fill out the form, we get your email, we get your phone number, and then we go from there and just kind of walk you through the process and get you on there. And um, again, that's just something where if, you, if, you got, if you're somebody that's telling me you don't have enough time, you don't know what's going on, I don't know how to do this, then just quit thinking about it, quit wasting time, you know, pedaling around not knowing what's going on, just pay somebody to do it. So anyways, that's a lot better than going to a generic gym where they're doing generic workouts. Get your own stuff. Last thing we're gonna read, process improvement. James Clear, same guy we just read from previous, a brief guide on how to master the art of continuous improvement. So we'll, we'll, again, quickly go through some of this and then I'll, I'll give you my lasting tips and we'll close this bad boy up here in 10, 15 minutes. Okay. So he recites the story of Brailsford, which by now is very good. Uh, it talks about the bottom line, okay? And they use a quote from Jim Rohn, who, he's an interesting character. He's a businessman. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was Herbalife or something. Let me check. It was a weird business that I'm not a fan of. Uh, what the hell was he a founder of? 
Um, he was a founder. You think it'd be right in his profile, for God's sake. It's like a big thing. I don't know. Herbalife. Yeah, it is Herbalife. Or he mentored the founder of Herbalife. Huh. Maybe he didn't found it then. I don't know. Regardless, he was involved with Herbalife, which is a multi-level marketing company. It's complete horseshit. So, you know, besides that little asterisk on his life, I like him a lot for his business coaching and his mindset, his motivation. He That's really, if you, if you want to check out Jim Rohn, spelled R-O-H-N, check, check him out on YouTube. He's got a lot of great clips where he's talking and he's got um, some good mindset stuff. Um, but he, they start with a quote here. It says, success is a very few simple disciplines practiced every day, while failure is simply a few errors in judgment repeated every day. That is a perfect summary on our state of fitness in the United States. It's not that we're uh, terrible people that are just such gluttons and we can't help ourselves. It's, 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 yes, there's some that are like that, yes. But most people that are just like 20 to 30 pounds overweight, it's just the small things that you're just doing wrong. You're doing them wrong so often. Usually it's an ignorance. You don't even know that these things are that detrimental to you. You're doing them. Like ordering pizza, you know, two times a week during Monday through Friday because you're tired from work and you get pizza and you eat too much pizza. And next thing you know, you're over your calorie limit and it's pre preventing you from losing weight. Everything else you do is great. So like it's like a couple small things here and there. So it's beautifully said a lot of small things, whether skewed positive equals success or skewed negative can be your failure. So it's not a cataclysmic big event um, that's stopping you from achieving your goals. So let's see here. He's gonna talk about optimizing daily decisions. Okay. You might assume, again, he's gonna use some examples. You might assume that humans buy products because of what they are. But the truth is that we buy often buy things because of where they are. For example, items on a shelf at, at the store at eye level tend to be purchased more than ones that are on the low levels for visibility. The ends of aisles are money-making machines for retailers as well at the end of the aisle. According to data cited by the New York Times, 45% of Coca-Cola sales come from end of aisle racks. That's unbelievable. Here's why this is important. Something has to go on the shelf at eye level. Something's going to go there. Something has to be placed on the rack at the end of the aisle. Something must be the default choice. Something must be the option with the most visibility and prominence. This is true not just in stores, but in nearly every area of our lives. There are default choices in your office, in your car, in your kitchen, in your living room. Here's James Clear's argument. He says, if you optimize the default decisions in your life, rather than accepting whatever's handed to you, it'll be easier to live a better life. Pretty cool. And he gives some examples. And this is pretty sweet. This is just from his website, jamesclear.com. I already read the title of this thing. It is Process Improvement, a Brief Guide on Mastering the Art of C Continuous Improvement. So there it is. There is the podcast episode. I'd like to wrap it up again. I want to thank my friend Pubs for sending me this information. I thought it would make a great podcast as soon as he sent it. As soon as he sent it, it wasn't a big thing where he needed to explain to me for, for 24 hours and I had to like understand what it was and, and then decide to do this. As soon as he said it, I didn't I did not know the story of Dave Brailsford. I heard the term marginal gains. I had a really good inkling of what that was. It took me three seconds to find online what it was. And yes, it's it, uh, something that is uh, thankfully natively inside my body, my brain. That's how I function a lot. I don't need to go, you know, from a, like take any skill or any event in your life. You don't need to go from an F to an A. You can go from a C to a B. That's, you can make marginal improvements and then that's when you end up at an A. But to go straight from D to A, Hard, very hard, you know, it, 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 it can, again, any skill. So what I'd like to do is get real practical, give you just a couple tips off the top of my head around fitness and health, how you can improve small things that will make a big difference at the end of the year. First, you've got to accept that premise. If you reject that premise, turn off my podcast, get out of here because you're not going to understand what I'm going to say next. You're just not. It's sad, um, but it's very, very, very true. People that have the mindset that they need to get things quickly and do, do extremes, They've got to change that first because no practical tip is going to penetrate that. You've got to be able to understand why you should change your mindset. It's very hard. It's a lot of awareness things. Um, but, but in any event, here we go. Let's talk fitness. Daily, you know, uh, planned physical activity, working out and exercising. Okay, here we go. Practical tips. Where are you starting from? Are you starting from zero days of working out? Zero days of planned physical activity in a week. 
okay? Are you starting at three or four or two, okay? Where are you currently? Wherever you are currently, take one step forward. Do one additional day. If you're doing zero workouts, you're not gonna just go from zero to five workouts a day. It ain't gonna, I'm just telling you, it's not gonna happen. It's not. And then you're gonna be so frustrated with yourself and blame yourself. And really, it's a lot more complicated than that. It's not a willpower thing a lot of times, okay? It's a habit thing. And habits are strong. They die hard. That's why addiction is a pain in the balls. Not just the chemical aspect of it. I mean, I'm talking like addiction of habit uh, because it becomes something that's just ingrained to us and it's almost like a subconscious thing that we don't think about every day. So wherever you are, physical, phys you know, physical activity-wise, go from zero to one, from two to three, three to four. Try to do one more day than, than you're doing on a weekly basis. The next part about fitness, what do I do? Well, what are you currently doing? You know, are you doing nothing? Well, then you should just start with bodyweight stuff at your house. Do the minimal, like, next step. Don't jump into joining a gym and going five days a week. Do not do that. Don't go from doing nothing to all of a sudden extreme workouts. I'm going to do an hour and a half at the gym. You know, you're just going to be beating against a wall that's going to collapse, okay? Um, you know, well, Fran, what happens if you have a paying client that goes from – what's a little bit different? We're, you know, we're here. We're doing – you know – when you join a program, okay, like ours, when, when, you, when you do something like online training, and e even if you join a boot camp class, you know, or you join one of those group fitness places that I smack talked earlier, it's new. So, and, uh, and you're paying money for it. So intuitively it has value. And so you stick to things easier. What I'm trying to get at is I'm trying to give you guys free tips to not change anything with your money. I'm talking about if you're just going to go at it on your own, if you already decided, well, I don't want to pay a trainer. I want to try this on my own. Well, here's what you'll do. You got to go from zero to one or from nothing to push-ups and, and, and sit-ups and, 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 sca and squats. You're just not going to go from zero to hero on your own. Now, if you're paying somebody, there's accountability built in. It's feasible. And even then, we don't come in with the bells and whistles and kettlebell snatches and cleans and, and battle ropes everywhere. Like we, we come in real basic dumbbells and a little bit of cardio and away we go. And, and we build up in advance. So... Again, that's the fitness tips. Increase the days per week by one and then try to increase the workout intensity. So if, you, if you've been doing body weight stuff, if you're doing push-ups, sit-ups, squats, lunges, calf raise, things like that, well, maybe it's time to go out and, and look at buying either a set of resistance bands or adjustable dumbbells, okay? Resistance bands, they're a really, really, really good sets for like a hard box. And it's a one-time purchase. Hard box, you get M, you get like a bazillion of these things in, in, in a bag. It comes with a door attachment. I mean, everything that you need, hard box, Message me if you want a recommendation. I'll give you the recommendation for a band set. Hard box, great investment, and now you take your workouts from body weight stuff to some resistance. Boom, done. But it's very different than saying, well, I'm going to go from all body weight to now I'm going to go power clean the gym and do deadlifts with the trap, you know, like with the straight bar. Like, big difference. And it's not that it can't be done. I'm just trying to give you something like minimal, 1% gains. Let's just try to take one little step. Moving on, let's go to nutrition. Are you tracking your calories? Are you putting them into MyFitnessPal? My if not, step one, download MyFitnessPal. Record what you're currently eating every day. Put it in. That's it. No changes. Don't try to consciously decide, well, I'm going to eat this many calories in the beginning. Just get the app. Take a, you know, it, it takes you 15 minutes a day. And once you get really good at it, it's like five minutes a day because it's got smart techniques and it knows what meals. Just trust me, trust me, trust me, trust me. It, it, it cuts down. So time is not a, a freaking excuse to not record your food. Get my fitness pal, start putting food in there. That's your step one. If you're already doing that, okay, are you inconsistent? Maybe some days you're tracking, some days you're not tracking. Then track every single day. Next baby step. Um, if you're already doing that consistently, you're tracking your calories, you're trying to get your food down. Next becomes protein. Okay, well, add in protein tracking. You should have one gram per pound of body weight. You weigh 200 pounds, try to get close to 200, pounds, or 200 grams of protein. Not always going to happen. It's very difficult. I don't get 205 grams of protein every day. I usually get between 160 and 190, usually. Some days it's 250, it just depends. But just try to get a little bit better every single day, okay? Supplementation, great question. Supplementation, supplementation by definition is to supplement your exercise and nutrition. So for me, if you're not exercising and you're not tracking your food already, don't think about supplementation. I don't think you need to, to go to that first. Do the other ones first, marginal gains, one thing at a time. Well, not, not necessarily one thing at a time, but uh, well, here, here's, what I, here's what I would say about this. My caveat on the mar marginal gains theory. My caveat on the marginal gains theory is I would have some concerns if people tried to do marginal things across the board all at once, especially going from zero to hero. So 
Yes, I think you can make subconscious efforts to improve multiple things if you get your mindset right. You'll notice a lot of things that you'll change naturally and a lot of things will improve naturally. That's fine. But if your mindset ain't right and you're trying to change your behavior and your actions first, you're going to run into a lot of resistance if you're trying to change 50 habits instead of changing one or two. So I think that, does that make sense? So I'm almost advocating a marginal gains on the marginal gains theory. Try to get 1%, try to, try to increase uh, 1% 1, 1 on a lot of variables 1% at a time. That's kind of my twist on this thing because that's how slow I am on short-term behaviors. I, I just really believe it. I've seen it happen so often that people get discouraged and they quit when they're too quick out the gates or they get overwhelmed too much. I even do it on basic things. I'll give you an example. I have a goal notebook. Every year I redo my goals. Some of the goals I accomplished, some I did not. Some I was way too short on and I and I blew out of the water in January and some of them I wasn't even close. Why well, recalibrate? Well, I also as part of that try to make a daily success guide. Meaning if I do these behaviors every day, and I make a list of like probably like five, six things. If I do these things every day for this amount of time, I will be successful. Well, if I go too rigid and structured on that and I have everything, you know, so at the end of the day, I've got six hours of things I got to do every single day on my, on my success guide. That's not leaving much left over for other things. And then next thing you know, <laughs> it gets deprioritized and I stop doing that. So it becomes useless. Um, so again, just try to, you know, be easy with yourself. The last thing I'll do, the last thing I'll do is the healthy habits uh, or just like your overall health. It is so about habit about habits it's unbelievable it is so much to do with your small behaviors than it does anything drastic i ain't saying you gotta hike every weekend i'm not saying you need to run a marathon i'm not saying that you know you have to radically alter all the things you're doing what i'm saying is if you start to do very small things and you add them in you sprinkle them in it'll add up over time so i mentioned before on instagram we had a post about walking the dog walking the dog is a great way to get additional activity outside of your workouts if you're doing nothing, well, that's your own source of activity. It's a pretty good upgrade. But if you're already at the gym and doing things right, and then you start walking your dog, it's very, yes, it's a very tiny addition. But I think the greater benefit comes from the habit. You're essentially reinforcing your healthy lifestyle. You're reinforcing to yourself, hey, I'm a healthy person. I do physically demanding and, you know, and, 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 uh, I do active things. Part of that is walking my dog up a hill or down a hill or around the neighborhood for a half hour. It's part of what I do. Part of the, the reason why I encourage going on hikes on the weekend, even if you're somebody that doesn't like hiking, you're reinforcing that you're an active person. Hey, what I do on the weekends, well, instead of sitting around drinking beer and eating pizza and going to the bar, I'm going to go on a hike. And then I can do some other things that, that, that are actually enjoyable. So I hope you guys found some value in this podcast. Um, I know, it's a, you know I sprinkled in those tips throughout, but just try to understand the marginal gains. This guy took a team that didn't win a damn thing. One medal in 76 years. And then they had a uh, seven out of 10, you know, pretty early on in, in his oversight. Um, it's pretty incredible. And I'm not, and the crazy part is I'm not even saying that you need to go from a nobody to an Olympian. You're not even an Olympian athlete. Most people listening to this podcast, AKA 99.9999% of you are not on a level of an Olympian when it comes to your health and fitness. You just need to be better than what you are. So you even have more of a, more wiggle room. You're not going up against other Olympic athletes competing. You're competing against yourself. And a lot of you yourself is close to a zero. And I don't say that to make you feel bad or to get up on you and make you get all depressed or whatever. I'm saying it because it's true. And truth takes priority over almost everything. That's your basis of your foundation is your truth. Your truth is a lot of you just aren't working out and eating like you're supposed to be. So you don't have this mammoth obstacle to necessarily overcome, but you will handicap yourself in that endeavor if you go balls to the wall and try to do way too many things way too intensely. Trust me, most of you are young. If you're 27 years old, you're young. If you're 37, you're young. If you're 41, you're young. If you're 56, you're young. You're not old till you're like 90 or like 80 nowadays. You're old when you're there. Everybody else is young in the big picture. So take one year out of your life, get your mindset right, get your habits right, and you can dramatically increase your fitness and your health in one year's time. If you're a 58-year-old and you're in terrible shape, well, when you're 59, you could be a lot better. You could be a lot better and you owe it to yourself and your family. 
Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you want to share your thoughts on this, reach out to us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and LinkedIn and YouTube and blah, da, 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 and all the different platforms that are out there. Search our company, Ramsley Fitness, and give us a shout out, whether it's a message, a comment, a share, whatever. We're into it. We respond. Thank you all for listening.